Okay, so the next topic we will be dealing with is the EU competence. As we have mentioned before, before the Treaty of Lisbon, there was no provision in the founding treaties. There was no provision in the founding treaties on the areas of EU competence. For the first time in the EU's history, the draft constitutional treaty provided for the rules on EU competence. But when the draft constitutional treaty was rejected, the provisions of the draft are provided in the Lisbon Treaty. Therefore, starting from the Treaty of Lisbon, the areas of EU competence are provided in the founding treaties. Attention, the treaties only provide when there is EU competence. Independent from the type of competence, when there is competence for the European Union, the treaties provide for such areas. The treaties do not provide when the member states have competence. The treaties do not provide when the member states have competence. We call these areas exclusive, the areas of exclusive member state competence. In these areas, the member states have competence, meaning that only they can adopt legally binding rules, okay? Uh, and of course, this has got nothing to do with the European Union, therefore they are not provided in the founding treaties as such. We will therefore speak only where the EU has competence. But, even if the member states have the competence, alone, they have to adopt acts, binding acts, according to the principle of loyalty. The principle of loyalty, the principle of loyalty, sadaqat principle. This means that even in the areas of exclusive competence for the member states, they shall exercise their powers to exercise a right to exercise a power in Turkish. Yetikulamak. They shall exercise their powers in a way not to jeopardize, not to jeopardize the attainment of the objectives of the European Union. To jeopardize. Hmm? Therefore, even if the member states have the exclusive competence in an area, they cannot adopt certain acts independent from the objectives of the European Union. They have to take the principle of loyalty into consideration. This is provided under Article 4, Paragraph 3 of the Treaty on the European Union. According to the EU treaty again, the powers not conferred upon the European Union in the treaties remain with the member states. The powers or the competences not provided in the founding treaties for the European Union shall remain with the member states. In the books, there are different divisions. In the books, there are different divisions regarding the EU competence. 
The first division is as regards the subject areas of EU competence. According to the subject areas, there are three basic types of competences. Three basic types of competences, depending on the subject areas. This division includes three main areas of EU competence. The first is exclusive EU competence. Second, the areas of shared competence. Third, supporting, coordinating, complementing competences of the EU. This division is new to the Treaty of Lisbon. This is, as we stated, the first time in the founding treaties that they make such a division on EU competence. When there was no such division in the founding treaties, where would you look at to find whether there is a competence for the EU in a given area? Yes, Dennis? I think we should, look, yeah, we should have looked at uh, Court of Charges of European Union and their case law, its case law. Because exactly. Yeah. Before the Treaty of Lisbon, we were looking at the case law of the Court of Justice to find out whether there is an, in an area the EU has competence, and if, if yes, then <coughs> does it share this competence with the member states or is this competence exclusive in character? Who will be doing the ERTA judgment of the Court of Justice in the presentation, the ERTA judgment? Okay, someone will do the ARTA judgment. <laughs> it's about the uh, implied competence of uh, the European Union as decided by the um, Court of Justice. All right? Uh, therefore, today, according to the founding treaties, there are three main areas of EU competence. The first is exclusive EU competence provided under Article 2, Paragraph 1 uh, of the uh, treaty on the functioning of the EU. In the exclusive competence, all powers are given to the European Union. Exclu in the areas of exclusive EU competence, all powers are given to the European Union. The transfer of power here is absolute and irrevocable. The transfer of power here is absolute and irrevocable. This means that the EU alone is able to adopt binding legislation. The EU in these areas uh, is able to adopt binding legislation alone, meaning without the involvement of the member states. This is the principle where and, uh, the areas of EU co exclusive competence are provided in the treaties clearly, as you will be seeing. Therefore, if uh, there, there is a need to adopt certain legislation in these areas, it will be the EU alone to adopt binding legislation. This principle has two uh, exceptions. In these two exceptional situations, the member states may also adopt legislation. First, if they are empowered by the EU, if they are empowered by the EU, and second, for the implementation of EU acts. Therefore, as a principle, the member states may no longer adopt binding legislation in the areas of exclusive competence, uh, but if they are empowered by the EU or for the implementation of EU acts, they may adopt legislation. There is a list 
in the founding treaties, including five areas of EU competence, which are exclusive. And this is a closed list, meaning numerous clauses. This, can, this list cannot be enlarged. First is the customs union. In Turkish, Gümrük Birliği. Second, common commercial policy. Third, the establishment of competition rules. The establishment of the competition rules. Necessary for the functioning of the internal market, the establishment of the uh, competition rules, necessary for the functioning of the internal market in Turkish. İç pazarın işleyişi için gerekli olduğu ölçüde rekabet hukuku kurallarının oluşturulması. Fourth, preservation. of marine biological resources under the common fisheries policy preservation of the marine biological resources under the common fisheries policy ortak balıkçılık politikası çerçevesinde denizaltı canlılarının korunması and lastly, the monetary policy of the member states, whose currency is the euro. The monetary policy of the member states, whose currency is the euro. Therefore, in these five areas, the rule is that the EU shall adopt binding legislation and not the member states. Um, when the EU has exclusive competence, it means that its competence is both internally and externally exclusive. We speak about exclusive internal competence and exclusive external competence. In these areas, therefore, which, we, which the founding treaties count in five, is both internally and externally exclusive. What do we mean here? Internal exclusive competence or exclusive internal competence. What would that mean? Internal. Within the European within the European Union, meaning that when there is a need for further legislation, the EU will adopt legislation for the member states within the European Union. What does it mean, external exclusive, exclusive external competence? Outside of the EU. Outside the EU. What does this mean then? The third country. Okay, when the, ex the competence is exclusive also externally, this means that the EU can negotiate and conclude international agreements by itself with third countries and international organizations. Therefore, the EU in these areas, when it's, con it's, ex uh, it's um, competence is exclusive, can conclude and uh, negotiate and conclude international agreements with third uh, countries and international organizations, uh, meaning without the member states. One party to this agreement is the EU alone, and the other party to this agreement is a third country or an international organization. For instance, if there is a need to adopt an international agreement on customs union with a third country, the EU will not need the member states to adopt this agreement because customs union is one of the five areas where the EU's competence is exclusive, okay? If 
there is an area in an area where the EU's competence is not exclusive, not exclusive, as you will be seeing, it will need the involvement of 28 member states to negotiate and conclude an international agreement. In this case, the uh, competence is not exclusive. Now, it is exclusive competence, all right? Uh, then we have shared competence and supporting, coordinating and supplementing competences of the European Union. In the areas of shared competence, Both the member states and the EU have competences. Therefore, both the member states and the EU are authorized to adopt binding acts. However, the member states exercise their competence if the EU has not exercised or has, has decided not to exercise its own competence. Therefore, the member states may only exercise their competence if the EU has not exercised its competence or has decided not to exercise its competence. When there is already an EU action in one of these areas, meaning if the EU has already adopted an act, then the member state cannot adopt an act anymore. If the EU has already adopted an act in these areas, then the member state cannot adopt an act anymore. Technically, therefore, we say the EU action supersedes the member state's competence. The EU action supersedes the member state competence. The EU action supersedes the member state's competence, meaning that when the EU has already acted, meaning it has already adopted an act, then the member states cannot, uh, cannot adopt an act anymore. The shared competence is the default situation. The default situation is the shared competence. If an area is not included in the first group of competence or in the third group of competence, then it is considered as an area of shared competence. Hmm? If an area is not provided under um, the first group or the third group, then it is considered as an area of uh, shared competence. Therefore, we can give examples of shared competence. For instance, the environment policy, the consumer policy, Internal market are considered as an area of shared competence. The third group is support, sorry, shared competence in Turkish. Paylaşımlı yetki alanları veya paylaşmalı yetki alanları. Supporting, coordinating, complementing, uh, sorry, Supporting, uh, coordinating, supplementing competence. Supplementing competence, supporting, uh, coordinating, supplementing competences of the European Union in Turkish. Destekleyici, koordine edici, tamamlayıcı yetki alanları. Like shared competence, the member states and the EU both have competence. The member states and the EU have both competence to legislate. But the EU's competence here 
is limited to sub support, coordinate, or supplement the actions of the member states. They both have power, but the EU's power is limited to support, coordinate, or supplement the actions of the member states. Therefore, here, which is different than or unlike areas of shared competence, the EU action does not supersede the member state competence. The EU action does not supersede the member state competence. It is the contrary. The member states will legislate the EU legislation or the EU cannot interfere in the exercise of the competences by the member states and its power is limited to support, supplement, or coordinate the actions of the member states. The EU action cannot aim harmonization. The EU action cannot aim harmonization. According to the founding treaties, the following subjects are considered within this last area of competence. Culture, Tourism, protection of human health, industry, civil protection, administrative cooperation, education, vocational training, youth, and sport. Okay, any questions? Yes? You said EU action cannot aim harmonization, and I don't understand that. Definition. Okay, you will see when we speak about sources of EU law. When the EU wants an area to be unified, it adopts regulations. When the EU wants an area to be harmonized, meaning that it does not prefer to to be that area exactly the same in the member states, but certain differences should be eliminated, then it, it adopts directives. In these areas, the aim of the EU cannot be harmonization, okay? It will be, uh, um, uh, it can adopt other acts uh, than regulations, directives, and mostly decisions, which uh, may be not binding to, uh, just to support the actions of the member states, okay? So the, here, the EU cannot adopt an act to harmonize the laws of the member states, because here, they say in the member states, not in the EU, okay? They will adopt their legislation, the EU will only support their actions, okay? Uh. The five areas of the exclusive competence are listed in the on the functioning uh, the treaty on the function, function of the EU. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the EU treaty you find provisions as well. Article three, for example. Um, okay. So as far as the subject matter is concerned, this is the main division in the founding treaties. But there are some additional areas of EU competence as well, other than these three main areas of competence, there are also additional areas of competence. For instance, the EU has special competences in the areas of economic, employment, and social policies. Economic, employment, and social policies of the member states. According to the founding treaties, the EU has the competence to coordinate economic policies of the member states by adopting broad guidelines. This is the name of the instrument, broad guidelines. In the employment policies, to adopt guidelines and as, as regards social policies of the member states, 
to adopt initiatives. Uh, the founding treaty speak about the adopting initiatives in the social areas, social policies of the member states, but not, does not provide for specific initiatives as their name. Therefore, the EU may take any initiatives according to the founding treaties. Secondly, this was the first additional area of competence. Secondly, the EU, as you all know, has power to adopt instruments, or first to develop, a common foreign and security policy, as well as a defense policy. Common foreign and security policy in Turkish? Or Takdush ve Güvenlik Politikası. Do you remember anything about common foreign and security policy? Where did we mention about the CFSP? Yes? You mentioned this in the master treaty because it's established three tier system and it was in the third tier system, I got it. Or the uh, third tier system. The common foreign security policy was the second pillar of the European Union, the second pillar. Uh, the Lisbon Treaty abolished the pillar structure. There is no pillar structure today, but of course, the competence, the power of the European Union. Uh, on different pillars continue. Uh, under the Lisbon, under the treaties today, as amended by the Treaty of Lisbon, the EU has the power to develop a common foreign and security policy as well as a defense policy. It has the power to adopt and to implement a CFESP. Uh, as we have mentioned, the EU develops this policy via the President of the European Council and the High Representative of the EU for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. Uh, but attention, the um, EU does not adopt legally binding acts as regards CFESP, Common Foreign and Security Policy. Here, still, like the Treaty of Maastricht, like under the Treaty of Maastricht, the cooperation is intergovernmental in character, and the Court of Justice does not have jurisdiction under, uh, under the treaties today as well, as regards the Common Foreign and Security Policy. All right? The second division we make about the competences of the European Union depends on whether the competence is clearly provided in the treaties or not. Depending on whether the treaties provide for an area of competence for the European Union. In certain cases, and today, probably, this is the rule uh, uh, following the amendments of the Treaty of Lisbon. The powers of the European Union are provided, the areas of competence for the EU, are provided in the founding treaties in an express way. How would we call these areas? Uh, or this power of the European Union, we call it express powers of the EU or explicit powers of the EU. Meaning the founding treaties provide for power for the European Union, and this is the rule today after the Treaty of Lisbon. This exclusive, sorry, this uh, express power may be exclusive or not, but this is another thing, as you know. It may have been provided as an exclusive power for the European Union or not. Secondly, if the power is not exclusive, then it may be implied. Or, 
or implicit powers, implied or implicit. What would that mean? Implied or implicit? Yes, Dennis. It's understand directly what that means. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean uh, whether the European Union has conquered or not. And we need to uh, the interpretation of proto justice, for example. And they they made it, they make decisions. And we hmm. understand uh, European Union has implied power, for example. What is it in Turkish? Örtülü veya zımni yetkiler. In the implied powers. The provision, uh, the competence of the provision, uh, sorry, the competence of the European Union are not provided, is not provided in the treaties in an express way. But here, the existence of a power is understood, the existence of a power is understood from the existence of another power. It is understood from the existence of another power which is reasonably necessary for the exercise of the former. I will give one, one example each for internal, from ex internal and ex external sphere. Uh, for instance, in a decision of the Court of Justice in Germany versus the European Commission, the question was about the power of the European Commission on the social policy or social field. According to the founding treaties, the Commission had the power to promote close cooperation. The Commission had the power to promote close cooperation between the member states in the social field. The Commission had the power to um, promote close cooperation between the member states in the social field. However, the treaties did not provide for an express power for the European Commission. On how to establish this close cooperation between the member states. Therefore, they did not, the treaties did not give a clear power, an express power to the European Commission to adopt a legislative act to establish close cooperation between the member states. When the European Commission adopted an act, the uh, German government taken an action before the Court of Justice, saying that the Commission did not have express powers to adopt legislation in the social field. The Court of Justice provided in its decision that when the treaties confer a special task to the European Commission, they shall also confer the necessary powers which are indispensable. When the treaties confer specific tasks for the European Commission, what is the specific task here? What is the specific task here? to promote close cooperation in the social field. When they give such a task to the Commission, then they also confer 
all the necessary powers to attain that objective. They also confer the other powers on the European Commission, which are indispensable. Indispensable? Ayrulamaz, devredilemez. Therefore, meaning, when the European Commission has the task to promote close cooperation between the member states, it should be understood that it also has the power, has the necessary powers to attain that objective. Here, it has also the legislative powers. Are the legislative powers of the Commission in this area, in this policy, uh, provided in the treaties? No. No, in an express way, no. How do we understand? We infer, okay? We understand from the existence of another power, which is to establish close cooperation between the member states. The second example is the ARTA judgment. Uh, some of you will present in, the, in class. This is from the external sphere. The question here was about um, conclusion of international agreements with third countries. And it was ruled by the Court of Justice that when the European Union has the competence internally in an area, meaning when the European Union has the competence to adopt binding legislation within the European Union, then it should be inferred that it also has the power to adopt international agreements in that area by itself. When the European Union has the competence internally, it should be understood that it has the power externally as well, even if the external power of the European Union is not provided in the founding treaties. Okay? Zimni yetki. So, the first possibility was when the power was provided expressly in the treaties. The second was, when it is not provided expressly, then we sometimes may understand impliedly from the existence of another power. Is there a third possibility? And if yes, what would be the third possibility? In the first one, we read from the provision that there is express powers for the EU. In the second, Yes, we understand from the existence of another power. There is none. Dennis? There is none. There is no power for the EU, yeah. but it can still legislate? Uh, maybe give opinion. <laughs> no, either it legislates or not. It is the question here. In the first one, we had power written in the treaties. We understood by just reading the treaty. In the second, we understood impliedly. Thirdly, can it be possible, although the EU does not have any competence, it can still legislate? Maybe it's optional. Is it possible or not? Yes. If it's possible, then wouldn't it be contrary to, to the principle of... Limited well, the principle of limited powers? But what if member states can uh, give power to the uh, European Union? Okay, very good. The third possibility is that when the EU does not have competence, but it can still legislate because the member states have given this power to the EU in the founding treaties. Here you go. The third possibility is the subsidiary powers. Please do not get confused with the principle of subsidiarity. In the first hour, we have spoken about the principle of subsidiarity. Now we speak about subsidiary powers and they are not related. Okay? In the exams, normally the students sometimes get very much confused. This is provided under Article 352 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Um, under this provision, if action by the... First, I will tell you the provision and then we can discuss. 
if action by the European Union should prove necessary to attain one of the objectives set out in the treaties, if an action by the European Union proves necessary to attain one of the objectives of the European Union set out in the treaties. And the treaties have not adopted the necessary powers and the treaties have not adopted the necessary powers, the Council, on a proposal from the Commission, and after taking the consent of the European Parliament, shall adopt the appropriate measures by unanimity. The Council acting on a proposal from the European Commission and taking the consent of the European Parliament shall adopt the necessary measures by unanimity. Okay, therefore the, the provision reads that the action by the EU should prove necessary. What does this mean? It is not clear in the founding treaties. It uses a vague terminology. When will it be necessary? Is a, or the necessary, the word necessary is very flexible and therefore includes a large amount of discretion on the part of EU institutions. They will determine when it is necessary to adopt a certain act. Secondly, the provision says that, that an action should prove necessary to attain one of the objectives of the founding treaties, but they do not refer to any specific provision of the founding treaty. Which objectives? Is that clear? It is not clear. It does not refer to any, any uh, explicit provision of the founding treaty. And it says that the Council shall take any appropriate measures. Does it determine which instrument will be adopted by the Council? Does it give a name? Does it say a decision, a directive, or a regulation? No, it does not say. Normally, it is clear in the founding treaties, depending on the policy areas. It will tell you, if you read the provision itself, you will understand that um, in this area, the Council will adopt this instrument, a regulation with the European Parliament, for example, acting by, say, qualified majority voting. Here, it requires Unanimity. Therefore, this provision is very much criticized in the EU in certain, by certain writers, saying that it is against, or it may be considered as against, uh, to the principle of limited powers, which is one of the main principles of the European Union law. But attention, can the EU adopt any act under this provision by itself as, as, as it likes? No. The EU, of course, needs the member states because it says the Council will do it. But can the Council do whatever it wants? No. no why not? Because the consent of the European Parliament is also required. First, it will act on a proposal from the European Commission. Then it will take the consent of the European Parliament, meaning consent? Riza. Riza, onai. And third, it will act by unanimity. Unanimity, therefore, you need the uh, positive vote of all the member states of the European Union. Okay? <clears throat> 
The next topic, the last bit of this topic, will be about principles of proportionality and subsidiarity. Uh, please read from the book for Friday. It is provided under a protocol attached to the founding treaties. Then on Friday, we will move to sources of EU law. We will finish the sources hopefully this week. And next week, we will continue with the uh, free movement, the free movement of goods. We will start with the substantive law of the European Union. All right, any questions so far? Okay, thank you very much then. See you on Friday.